Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Well, it's good to see so many people here today. Um, before we start, um, how many people here have done the level one and level two uh, Dante certification training? Oh, fantastic. That's very good. So the thing to remember about today is that normally I would do this course in two days in England in English. So doing it in one day is very hard. Um, you have copies of the deck, which, which is good. Um, it would be good to read it a few times uh, because it's a lot of information. And the other good news is that we are going to be rolling this out for web presentation uh, in about six to eight weeks time. So we are going to break this down into 15 or 20 short videos so you can watch individual sections as well. So today is really a run through of the material that we have on our advanced training course. And hopefully it will give you an idea of some of the things that are underlying Dante on an IP network. Um, does anybody here have a uh, computer networking background already? Good. Right. Well, you, you can have a nice sleep. <laughs> this, is, this is mostly to do with general networking. It, it will be useful for even setting up your office computer networks. Um, there are some small things about Dante in here, but the main thing to remember is that these skills are the deep skills underlying all networking, and it is not necessary to understand all of this stuff to be successful on an audio system. The stuff that you have already done in levels one and two is perfect for being successful with audio. Okay, so let's get started. So my, my name's Kieran Walsh. Uh, I am the Director of Application Engineering for Ordinate in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, I've been with the company since 2010, um, helping manufacturers to put Dante into their equipment, and more recently I've been looking after training nice people like you guys. Um, previous to working with Ordinate, I worked for a uh, large live sound company in London. Um, we used to be the sound company for the band Pink Floyd and lots of other bands like that. So. Uh, my experience has been very hands-on doing television shows, doing large concerts, uh, and really putting this stuff uh, into the wild. So um, there are plenty of good stories. Okay, so um, we're going to look at some advanced networking concepts. Um, the main reason why we are doing this is that we have this overall certification program. Um, this official certification lets your customers know that you have been through the courses and understood and passed the exams and uh, allows people to know that you have the key skills required to implement uh, an audio network. Also by doing it as formal training uh, we can ensure a consistent set of methods and knowledge. This means that it is much easier for us to support you because we can ask questions and get answers in a uh, framework. So we can be much quicker and much more successful that way. So with the certificates, um, you guys have already said you, most of you have done levels one and two, so you will be familiar with the idea that you have the certificates that you have as PDFs. And uh, when you have completed this course, uh, you'll be sent an email and you'll be able to do the level three exam online. And you'll get a certificate for each level passed. So as you're well aware, level one is a basic introduction to Dante, what it is, what basic signal routing is, and setting up a simple six unit system. Level two, slightly more advanced, setting up between 12 and 20 devices, understanding a little bit more about how uh, the data goes across the network in the form of unicast or multicast flows. A little bit about latency, and a little bit about redundancy. So of course, as you know, the required steps for level one 
passed level one online, level two passed the two level two online exams, and the same for level three. There will be a level three exam that you'll get access to. So this is the main topics that we are going to cover today. Uh, we'll look at who Ordinate are, why use Dante, where Dante is used, what Dante is, and how to work with Dante. We'll then look at some of the architectural principles involved in setting up a data network. We'll look at um, how to optimize network components, a little bit of troubleshooting, and looking at how uh, Dante works in what we call a converged data network. And then we'll look at general networking knowledge because these things go hand in hand. After all, Dante is a service that sits on a standard IP network. We'll look at what a network is, um, where networks are used and how to understand networks. We'll look at the architectural principles of networks as well um, and look at how we, can, uh, how we can cover some of the topics in general that will be covered specifically by manufacturers of networking hardware and where those differences may be. So Ordinate are an Australian company um, originally and they're headquartered in Sydney, Australia. Ordinate started because a group of scientists uh, restructured out of Motorola and went and joined a government funded research institute in Sydney. Um, so the company is founded by computer scientists and network engineers. Um, I think I was the first full-time audio person to join the company in 2010. Um, and the company's goal is to develop Dante as a 100% interoperable solution for all audio equipment manufacturers. So what we make is we make all of the Dante technology. So this could be hardware modules, like the Brooklyn 2 module that we have here. We provide development tools to manufacturers. This will be in the form of product development kits for testing and also software tools so that manufacturers can write their own software. We also make software products for end users in the form of Dante controller that you hopefully are all familiar with. We also have the Dante virtual sound card and we have Dante Via. And now we have the, also the Dante domain manager which helps us to make very large, very secure networks. So why use Dante? Um, some very, very simple reasons, really. Um, it sometimes seems like it is stating the obvious, but a network is, is a group of things that connect. Now, computer scientists um, often hijack terms. So a network has become synonymous in language with a bunch of computers connected together. Well, that's only one kind of network. There have been networks for thousands of years. Um, an obvious early network is the postal network where we could send packages uh, by horseback, by riders, all over the world. And that's been going on for thousands of years. So don't let computer people steal terms. They have this bad habit of doing this. So with any network, interoperability is the key. And now that's true of a postal network as much as it is of a data network. Indeed, if you look at the, um, the railway network, that is a good example of a network where we have to have standards to make it work. The obvious standard in a railway is how far apart the wheels are on the train. It's called standard gauge, of course. And that was based upon um, a broad measurement uh, based upon the width of the rear end of two horses originally. It was the, uh, uh, the, the value of 100 of those divided through uh, to get this standard gauge. And then, of course, like all standards, there were variations. So if we look, um, if we look at things like other railway networks, the standard railway network has this, what we call the standard gauge. Uh, if you ever go to uh, the former Soviet Union, they, you will notice the train tracks are much wider there. Um, because it's a smoother ride. The same thing happened in England. There was one gentleman who decided for his private railway he wanted a different width track. So in parts of England there are three rails, two to do the standard gauge and then a third one to do the wider gauge. So that's been going on forever. People have taken standards and modified them and made their own things on top. There's, there's nothing new and this indeed has happened also in data networking. 
So it's important to understand that there's nothing wrong with taking standards and enhancing them. Basically, the better the network, the more things it can connect together. So interoperability is absolutely key for any kind of network. Um, it's, it's no good making something that has wheels if you have a lake to go across. So you just need to make sure everything can talk to each other. So from that perspective, there are more than 1,400 different Dante-enabled products in the market now. So uh, there's a big ecosystem. There are more than 350 manufacturers making Dante products. And we've shipped um, way beyond 1 million Dante-enabled endpoints. So there's a lot of devices out there to connect to. So that makes a already nice network to connect into. So why use Dante? Well, if it has the Dante logo on it, it will connect to any other device with the Dante logo on it. That is, after all, the uh, point of the company and the point of having a network. Uh, and Dante is a commercially developed and supported solution. So people often ask about standards. Standards are great. Standards are like having fuel you, you put in the car. We, we use lots of standards inside Dante, as, w as we will see. Um, the nice thing about being an implementation, so we are more like the car than the fuel, because we can change the wheels, we can change the engine. We can decide to run on an entirely different kind of fuel if we want. That's up to us. All we have to ensure that we do is if we change the engine, we have to make sure it works with the old engines that people will be using and the new engines people use into the future and make sure we maintain that interoperability. That's why we exist. Whereas a standard is a bunch of words at a particular point in time that define one thing. And standards do change, they have to. Standard, but st once a standard changes, it gets a new number and becomes a new standard. As an implementation, we can carry on evolving and bringing those standards in and delivering them in a meaningful and workable way. So it's, you can't really compare Dante to a standard um, because Dante may just include those standards. Actually, it often does. So Dante is a solution rather than uh, a specific standard, um, and that's why it's the most widely adopted audio networking solution ever. Um, obviously, uh, over the years, I've had some visibility about how it has developed, and what we use today is really quite different to what I first started using 10 years ago as a customer, which is a really good thing. It's much bigger, it's much more stable, it's got a lot more features than it used to. That's how these things develop. So some examples of just some places where Dante has been used. Um, because we sent this deck a long time ago, this was focused on a presentation a colleague had done in the United States. So this is very US-centric, I apologize. Um, so we use Dante in lots of arenas. Um, many, many government institutions. So this is um, a government institution in Australia who were kind enough to let us use their photographs. Um, there are lots of other government institutions that will not let us use their photographs uh, that we cannot talk about publicly, um, which is fine. Um, the, a lot of them are concerned with doing many languages. So I think this is a big thing in, in China as well, that people want to do lots of translation from different dialects and different languages in, in a big meeting room. Uh, and, and we do a lot of that. So there are some institutions that have up to 128 languages. And um, yeah, the, the translation is, is, is an amazing thing when you, you don't realize it, 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 how difficult it is until you have to interface with how those systems actually work. I, I, I didn't think of it until I actually had to confront one of these very big translation systems and I really don't know how translators do it. <laughs> so hard. Many universities. Um, university lecture capture is, is very similar to the governmental process in a, in a lot of ways. What you're trying to do is you're trying to take a lecturer, record the content, maybe video it, and also distribute that on the internet for a wider public. Oftentimes you want to transcribe that into text and in, sometimes in different languages. So that works very, very well with lecture capture, government, 
and again also into the justice system so courtrooms where people want to take transcriptions of court cases have them immediately searchable in legal databases that's also a very popular system and of course um, one of the big things in the United States is house of worship they have these huge churches uh, where you could have 30,000 people in a congregation um, this is an example where they have a very very big congregation they also have their own television stations uh, they distribute across fiber optic across multiple cities it's a it's a massive broadcast operation on the entertainment side um, the uh, film La La Land which did very well um, it's it's one of those films that you watch on an aeroplane I find um, so some things I didn't know about the film until I, until I started researching this. Um, all of the music for the film was actually recorded live on set. And it was actually recorded on these little boxes here. Um, each of those can record 64 channels uh, from the Dante network into hard drive recorders. They were recording 128 microphones on set. And they didn't use a scoring stage to do the music, which was very impressive. It was a good sounding film. So yeah, all recorded live, very, very, very impressive. At the other end of the uh, cinema production um, c uh, process, uh, companies like Goldcrest Films in London, who are responsible for a lot of the finished mixing of uh, movie audio tracks, they use Dante to move um, content around their facility and also for distributing to multi-channel uh, Dolby Atmos systems. So that's becoming a more common use uh, in, in the dubbing end of things. This is um, an example of a movie scoring stage in Vienna. Uh, absolutely beautiful place. So they have a 96 channel solid state logic console here connected via Dante. If you notice these little boxes on top, this was because they put in the solid state logic system and the first big scoring uh, producer said he wanted a Neve desk. Oh dear. So they went and bought Neve preamps and put them on top and said, is that okay? And he went, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> if you, it, it, I was there about five weeks ago. It's absolutely beautiful. It sounds fantastic. Um, it, it's just, yeah, a really, really nice place to record music. So what Dante is, it's a networking technology, understandably, um, and it's both the technology and also the solution that's provided. So Dante is a hardware solution that we provide to equipment manufacturers. It's software solutions that we provide to um, end customers and equipment manufacturers alike. And, and what it does is we provide very tightly synchronized media playout at every point in an IP network. So that means that the timing of any audio coming out of a device will be within one microsecond of every other device anywhere in the network. At the moment, we're uh, carrying uncompressed digital audio at all professional sample rates. And one of the key things to any network these days is making it simple to plug and play, discover devices, and work both across a local area network uh, and a routed IP network. And most importantly, one of the key design principles that we took from the beginning was that we had to take the world as we found it. So it's absolutely key that we work on commercial off-the-shelf network infrastructure and we don't demand new or different infrastructure uh, because that is also a barrier to adoption as other networking standards have found. So um, first section, let's look at what a network is. Uh, and we can compare different ways of connecting audio devices. We'll briefly look at uh, TDM networking techniques, which are time-centric networking techniques. And we'll also look at packet uh, switch networks, which are address-centric. I'm using the terms time-centric and address-centric to try and break down any kind of um, you know, competitive idea here. Th th these are really fundamentally how, how these systems are looked at. So, Here's an example of an older system. Indeed, personally, I, I have no problem with this. I recorded a few albums using exactly this kind of equipment, um, and, and we sold a few records. 
did very well, actually. Um, so we, we have a proprietary word clock cable going from the external word clock to the preamp. We also have to put word clock into our desk and also into our audio interface. We have ADAT light pipes going from the desk into the audio interface. We have a proprietary meter bridge cable and we have an AES cable going to our remote head amps. We also have a remote control cable so that we can control the head amps remotely as well. And then of course if we wanted to, we could control the mixing desk from the computer over USB and we can also connect the computer to the audio interface over Firewire. So lots of different cables, fairly complicated to put together. Um, with a Dante system, we can simplify it down to just this. And those simple Cat5 cables do every single function of that myriad of cable we just had. So we have metering, we have control, we have audio, we have clocking, all on the same cable infrastructure, all on the same uh, low-cost uh, Ethernet switch. So what are the advantages? In the older system, we have lots of different kinds of cable to buy, lots of different kinds of cable to keep spares of, whereas in the newer system, all we have to worry about really are Cat5e cables. And one of the things that we were looking at when first evaluating this kind of technology in my last company was availability. We, w we were doing shows all over the world and I want to be able to get replacement parts for anything locally. It's probably fair to say that it is easier to get a Cat5 cable anywhere in the world and it's easier to get that than get a microphone cable. You can even buy Cat5 cables in the supermarket now. Um, not that you should, they're too expensive, <laughs> but, but you can. In fact, you can even buy network switches in some supermarkets. And, and you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> but, you, but you can. Um, and this was the prime consideration. If we had a show, say, in Singapore, and we were in London, and something went wrong, could we send somebody to the shop to buy some stuff to get the show back on without us having a major embarrassment? Because nothing is worse than telling 80,000 people that you know, they need to come back tomorrow because something is broken. The world doesn't work like that. So a Dante network is a collection of devices that are connected via a technology called IP, and they can exchange audio information with each other. But in order for this to work, um, devices need to be automatically discovered, and the devices also need human readable names. Uh, we also need to have diagnostic information and we also need to manage um, who has access to what in, an, in a network as well. We need to start securing networks when they get large. So this is not a new problem. Um, if anybody remembers the days before we had the public internet and you had to use a telephone and phone up the university to get a connection to some kind of bulletin board system, I'm talking about in the 1980s, I just about remember doing this. Uh, it was unusable, really. The, there was an American television executive in the early 1990s who said that the internet was a wonderful idea, but it would never go anywhere because it was a thing for science geeks. And at that stage, that would have been entirely correct because you had to remember special codes to make it work. Now we look at the modern internet, everybody's using it. I, my mother is a big football fan and she buys her tickets to go and see Manchester United on the internet. She can't remember IP addresses, she doesn't remember numbers, she types in manchesterunited.com, up comes the webpage and she gives them their money. I am not a Manchester United supporter, I support Arsenal, I, I like football. But yeah, and, and you can even get the train tickets to go to the football game and plane tickets and, and all those things just by typing in names. That's the really key thing that made the internet usable was this moving from numbers to names. So that's why we have done this in Dante. It's very, very important to just use these methods that made something such a worldwide success. Now, of course, 
this is why the term network has become something that computer scientists have hijacked. If we walked onto the street and asked anybody what they thought of as a network, most people would say, oh, the internet. Most normal people. Um, that does not make it correct that computer scientists can steal the term, but they have a good, good argument, say so it's popular. And of course, the biggest network in the world is the public internet, and that is based upon IP technology. So networking does not mean IP. It, IP is just a big form of networking that most people have had experience of. So why has IP become the dominant networking technology? Um, it's quite simple. It's supported by the most electronics manufacturers in the world. Nearly every electronic equipment manufacturer has some kind of understanding of IP. Whether they particularly use it or not is up to them. It's been applied to all industries, so banking, space rockets, very big science projects, um, various things on the public internet. And that's because it's very flexible. So the prime reason why IP is a flexible technology is because out of the box, the network is neutral. There is no preference for one kind of traffic over another. That's, that's what makes it flexible. The address space within IP means that you can reach a true global scale. And of course, once you have a unified addressing system and communication system, you can use the same kind of cabling and switching equipment, which means we can take advantage of the economies of scale inherent with, within everybody using the same kind of connector. And IP continually evolves. We're going to be focused mainly upon IPv4 type styles today because that's what we need. Um, oh, personally, I'm a massive fan of IPv6 as well. Um, some qualifications on this. So IPv4 is the method that we use currently with Dante. IPv4 gives us 4.3 billion IP addresses and that's fine. Nobody has bought a Dante network that big yet. If any of you want to buy 4.3 billion Dante devices, please come and talk to me. We, we can do a deal, okay? We'll probably do IP, IPv6 then as well. It, it might be cheaper to buy the entire audio industry. But you, if you want to do 4.3 billion devices, I'd be very happy to talk to you. But for right now, 4.3 billion on a single network is, is probably okay for us. And it's that thing where you, you don't get something for nothing. Um, IPv6 is huge. It's brilliant. Okay, I, I use it for internet projects with my French friends. We, we have some things that we have to use v6 for. Uh, the difference is v4 has 4.3 billion addresses, which seemed like a lot in the 1990s, but is not anymore. So when, to put this into context, when IPv4 came out, the population of the world was less than 4.3 billion people. Now it's a lot more than that. So there's a problem. IPv6 uses a 128-bit address space. Now that is an unimaginably large number. Basically, it's so big that if you gave every single atom on the surface of the planet an IP address, you would have enough IP addresses left over to do another 99 planets in the same way. It's, it's a huge number. Now, like I said, you don't get something for nothing. So if we put IPv6 onto Dante, we would have to use a lot more space for the address. Most people would prefer to have 40, uh, would, most people would prefer to have 64 audio channels rather than say 56 because you have to use memory for addressing rather than audio. And as audio engineers, we'd rather have the audio, thank you very much, and only have 4.3 billion devices rather than enough to do every single atom on the planet. So that, that, that's why that choice. So of course, if, if anybody came along to um, my talk yesterday, I was talking about in the early days before we were moving audio over IP, um, we had a different cable for every kind of task. Uh, I remember using uh, nine pin serial cables using RS-485 to connect amplifiers across uh, concerts. Then we started using CAN bus, which was really exciting. Um, 
and of course then we would have separate audio cables we would have some AES cables we would have MADI cables we would have separate analog audio cables and we'd end up with these big bundles of cable and big boxes of cable in the truck and it was all very heavy um, as this evolved onto an IP landscape we managed to put multiple kinds of data into the same cable uh, and it's very important to remember this. this this is the only technical reason why you would want to use IP IP exists solely to put multiple different kinds of data onto the same cabling infrastructure. That's, that's its real advantage. Yes, you do take a small penalty for latency for doing that, but it's minuscule. Uh, but that is, that is the technical advantage of IP. Um, any other argument becomes technology for technology's sake, which is never really a good reason to do anything. That, that's the reason for doing IP, just that, in that one line. There is a commercial reason, of course, for doing IP, which is the other reason, which means you save a load of money. I think those two reasons together are actually good enough. You don't really need to discuss it any further. This, this lovely stuff about it's the future and this is where everybody's going, yes, yeah, so what? Those are the two reasons why. There's no need to discuss it further. They're, they're obvious. Now, before we had IP networks, um, we used a time-centric mechanism for distributing audio. Now, this started off uh, in the telecommunications industry, and it was adopted by the audio equipment industry and was put into standards like AES-3 and AES-10, also known as MADI, and also AES-50. And the reason why this was attractive was that a TDM network runs at a set rate this means that a TDM network is a, considered a synchronous network. What happens in a TDM network is there is a concept of time slots and they have data put into them. And as long as the receiving end understands what the meaning of the time slot is in the same way that the transmitting end did, then you will get transparent data transfer. Now, on a TDM network, the capacity of the network depends upon the master clock frequency and therefore, by extrapolation, the number of time slots that are implied by this. TDM networks, by that definition, are therefore not neutral. So, why were they popular? Well, in simple networks like uh, voice communication in telecommunications and for audio-only transports like MADI or AES-50, it's not a problem. You're trying to transport lots of the same traffic. So your network is dedicated to one purpose. You basically set your master clock rate as a multiplier of your media clock rate. No problem. So it's very, very efficient at moving one kind of data traffic. In fact, arguably more efficient than using a packet switch technology like IP. Um, but it's not neutral. So. This was absolutely fine um, all throughout the 1970s and 1980s when um, digital telephone networks were very, very popular everywhere in the world. Very, very, very successful. Nothing wrong with it. And then this very, very annoying thing called the internet came along and suddenly this made um, TDM networks very, very inefficient because it was necessary to reserve time slots for data that was probably not going to be there. If you consider the difference between looking at a web page, when I open a web page, there's a big burst of data. All the pictures come down. Uh, then, I, then as a human being, because I'm slow, I have to read that web page so nothing happens on the data network. And then I go to the next page, and there's a big, big flow of activity, and then nothing again. So on a TDM network, that becomes very, very inefficient. TDM does not deal with burstiness very well. TDM deals with continuous data incredibly well, especially as if that data is of the same type. Now, of course, there were compromises made. Uh, there were methods for sending audio gain information next to a MADI channel. Fine, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny amount of data. Yeah, you can make these kind of compromises, not really a problem. But a packet switch data network allows you infinite flexibility to carry all kinds of data types as long as you follow a few very basic rules. So a good, good, a good friend of mine was an infrastructure engineer in uh, Ukraine on the telecoms network. And he used to complain all the time about having to run new cables between Odessa uh, and Kiev because they had one of the old um, uh, BT digital systems. 
and he was very pleased when he managed to sell that system to Nigeria and bought himself a nice shiny new packet switch data system because it meant he had to dig the road up a lot less. Well, his engineers had to, he didn't have to. <laughs> um, and that's basically because sometimes they would end up with capacity, their, their, their call capacity on that trunk would go one or two calls over what was required, so they would have to basically give a busy signal or, or do some other strange stuff or ultimately have to put in a new cable because as we can see here, on a MADI system, if I want to send 65 channels, I have to put in a whole new cable and go to 200% capacity. Whereas on a packet switch network, we have some flexibility. There is uh, some soft headroom to actually get around these things. This is a very bad drawing of a Swiss flag. It's a neutral network. It could be an Irish flag now, I suppose. So why do we use packet switched um, networks in computers? So the normal desktop experience that we all have is that we want to run all of these different services on our computers all the time. So I would want to look at the internet, I might want to watch a movie, uh, I want to listen to music, uh, I might want to look at different things um, like other social media websites, and I also might want to look at my email. And this is just what I expect. I mean, my computer or even my cell phone is doing many, many different connections to the internet all at the same time over a network. And the reason why that works is that in a packet switch network or an, an address-centric network, every single application has its own address. So here's a simple example here. If I open up a, a web browser, in this case it's uh, the Chrome browser, and the user has typed in an address into that browser, in this case it's uh, youtube.com, and my computer needs to look up this word YouTube or, or anything else. It, th th this this human-readable name makes no sense to a computer. Computers only understand numbers. So it doesn't know the IP address. So what it wants is something like a telephone directory. You know, like in the old days, you'd look up an uh, a person's name and address in a telephone directory, get the number, give them a call. On the internet, there is a system called DNS, and a popular DNS address is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. We can make an inquiry to a public DNS of any description, doesn't have to be this one, and say, hey, I'm looking for an IP address for this particular URL. The DNS server will look that up and it will return the IP address for that particular service. And just like in the old days, um, you, you would write down uh, the message that the directory service person had given you on the telephone because they charge you loads of money for it. I mean, okay, you could be really flash and get them to connect you and cost loads and loads of money, but no, I, I always used to write those down. It's stupid to waste money. The, very, very much like today, how, how many people remember their friends' telephone numbers? I, I, I put it into my mobile phone, I, I type in their name, that's it. I'm, I'm doing something very, very similar to DNS. I have a number, I resolve it to a name, when I want to call that person back, I, I look up their name, I don't look up their number. And that, that's just how we've got used to living. I do remember in the very old days when I used to have a book and I'd write everything down and then I would have to get on the old telephone and t t t do the turny wheel number and phone them up that way. So yeah, we, we, we've migrated to being very much like DNS as humans in our everyday use of telephones as well. So now I know the IP address of the person I want to talk to, I also need to know some other things to have a communication. So I need to know what the address of the particular web browser I'm using, so I can look that up inside the computer. And in this case, uh, this web browser is sitting on TCP 53618. Luckily the computer know knows its own IP address as well, that helps. And it also knows it wants to connect securely to the other end. And it knows that if it calls port 443, it will maybe get a secure HTTP connection. So it will try phoning that particular number at the IP address. So off we go. The, the computer sends a message saying, hi, IP address of the remote service at port 443. It's me. Here's my IP address. 
can you please call me back at TCP port 53618 because that's the browser that I want to di display the information in. This goes across the internet. And of course then the server at the other end says, hey, what can I do for you? Now, now YouTube is a uh, video channel and basically everybody knows what internet video channels are there for, yeah? It doesn't matter whether it's YouTube, it could be any of them, yeah? So this would be a normal transaction with an unknown server. Whereas with an internet video service, we all know that we want cat videos. So there we go, really easy. That's what they're there for, isn't it? So just like on a computer, um, we can have different uh, application addresses. We have uh, 53618 for one web page. We have 53653 for another different service. We're using 67123 for our um, Outlook service for our email. Uh, we're using, for music, we're using a different TCP address. They all have remote IP addresses which are different because they're from different servers across the internet. If we contrast this with what's going on in a Dante system, it looks like this. So we have a service on Dante called PTP that has this specific remote IP address and a specific remote port address. We also have audio flows that contain audio channels. They also have UDP addresses. And you can see here at the bottom that we have some kind of gain control message, which may be going to a mixing console. And we can see that that is at the same device address as our uh, first audio flow. So it's likely that that is some kind of stage box with audio coming from it. So we work in exactly the same way with a Dante system that we would do using any other kind of application uh, that you may find on the internet. That's why it works in very much the same way. And in order to do this properly on a computer system, we have to have what we call a full stack implementation. So people talk about layer two and layer three networks. In fact, what we're doing is a full stack. And we will come on to what that means uh, in the next few slides. So how do we keep these things all together, but also keep them separate at the same time? We can use our address book. We can make different telephone calls to different people at different times on different phone numbers. We could have a conference call where we can phone multiple different telephone numbers. We can use this network address book to tell us which particular cable we connect to. Or we could use this on top of a TDM system. So a standard Ethernet system that we would normally connect a Dante device through um, is an asynchronous network. But because of the nature of uh, layered network models, it is possible entirely to do IP over a TDM network. It's just you begin to lose some of that neutrality. But they are, are interchangeable. So earlier telecom systems did do uh, IP over TDM which is where we got that problem with the data burst and the bad framing, which is why a lot of people moved to Ethernet at layer two, because it suits bursty data traffic profiles better. But they can be swapped in and out from each other. That's very much the flexibility of using modern network models. So this is all part and parcel of what we call encapsulation. And this is how we organize the data we're going to send and receive. This is how we... Uh, create what we call address-centric circuits from application to application. So anybody who's done a formal networking course may well be familiar with this uh, wonderful seven-layer model called the OSI model. Um, it's very useful. Um, it's also a little bit old. So if you're doing, say, a Cisco training course, Cisco try to slavishly train you in this because the OSI model has been around for a long time. It's been certainly around since the 1970s, so it's 40 years old. Um, from a network engineering standpoint, it's great because it really nicely defines these layers here. And if you're configuring a data network as, as an engineer, trying to make a system work, this is absolutely brilliant. It's a really, really nice way of thinking about the world. The problem with the OSI model is that um, it's older. 
it's really great at defining this part at the bottom. This bit at the top, I'm sorry, from a software engineer's perspective, it's totally meaningless. But it was replaced in the early 90s with something called the TCP over IP model, which is much nicer for software engineers because we have everything up here. This is where we do our stuff as software engineers. We hand it to the network stack and magic happens. And now as software engineers, we don't care about what magic is happening. It just goes, ooh, and it comes out the other end, hopefully. And it's the network engineer's problem to make this bit work. The problem with this approach is that whilst this is very, very nice for software engineers, it's horrible for network engineers. Because there's no detail here. And that's what you want. So the old version gives you this beautiful detail at the bottom, which is great for troubleshooting a cable into a switch, into a router. Whereas this version is great if you're just writing code and you don't care about the details of doing the wiring. So it's quite understandable that if you do a network equipment course, you will be learning the OSI model because you do not need to worry about the software implementation. And if you do a software engineering course, you will be more comfortable with this model. So the, the simple question that people ask is, well, okay, that, that's very well, well and good. There are two models. Which, which one is the best to learn? Problem is both. Um, I started off personally as a network engineer, much, much more comfortable with the first model. Uh, and then um, I had to write some software. I like this model a lot better now. That, that doesn't make me right. That just means my perspective has changed. So yeah, I, I, I really like this now. Um, but I can see why the OSI model is very, very important if you're trying to make a network function. So this is what we call encapsulation. These sit next to the network models. So this is how I look at stuff as a software engineer uh, when I want to pass some data onto the network. So I, I create some data in my application. Now that could be some audio samples from a Dante device. It could be uh, some frames from a video of a cat running around the carpet. Doesn't matter what it is. And the first thing I need to do is I need to uh, give an idea of the address I'm sending it from. So remember when we had our web browser and we wanted to get the cat video, that web browser had that special address, that 53618 address. Um, if anybody thinks of uh, an old audio system with a big analog multi-core, yeah? Um, this is very, very parallel. If I have a multi-core with 65,536 pairs on it. That, that is basically one side of my TCP stack. I have two of those, one for send, one for return. I then have another 65,536 send channels and also another 65,536 return channels and UDP. So I have this massive multi-core. That's what that 53618 is. It means that's, that's the individual pair on my multi-core. Th there are more parallels to analog audio with networks. Has anybody ever seen what we call a festival patch on analog, yeah? So what that means is typically in a music festival when we have lots of bands, uh, we have certain channels that have certain functions. So I will always put the kick drum down channel one. There's nothing to stop me putting a different instrument down channel one, but all that will happen is I will make everybody else very angry because they're expecting the kick drum to be there. And the same thing happens with IP networks. Port 80 is always unsecured HTTP for websites. Port 443 is always secured HTTP for websites. There's no law that says you have to do that. But if you do something different, you'll make everybody else very angry. So just like doing a festival system. So on a festival system, we reserve channels 1 through 48, typically. And the lead singer is nearly always channel 24. On an IP system, because we have more cores, we have 65,536. Uh, we reserve everything below channel 1024 for a specific purpose. 
and anything above that is is aux channels basically you can do what you like with them so that that's why it's similar so here we would have our destination and our source port defining the address that is connected to that particular pair of cables on a particular protocol so here i'm saying i'm either using for example tcp or udp in this protocol block i'm saying which connection i'm coming from so that's a bit like which aux send i'm coming out of my mixer on and i'm saying which, which destination port i'm going to so which input channel at the other end i'm going to so it's exactly the same method i then have to describe my so destination ip address and my source ip address so this assumes that I have many, many different multi-cores coming up in my position, and I need to define the number of the set of cables I'm connecting to. So that's why I have a destination IP address and a source IP address. The thing to remember is that anybody who has a background in analog audio engineering is already an excellent network engineer because we have to deal with signal flow, and this is how we've always worked for our entire careers. So don't let ne network engineers push you about because they have never done anything involving signal flow. You're already at a massive head start by being able to go A to B to B to C to C to D for troubleshooting. Uh, when, I, when I was training in London um, doing network engineering, I was working with a lot of guys who work for the big banks. And we, we have this saying that whenever you have... Um, Whenever you have a hammer, every problem becomes a nail. So we would learn these techniques in the class, and of course everyone would be going, I want to try this out. We've done this really complicated thing. Right, he's given us this problem. It must be related to that. No, normally it was just, oh, yeah, follow the signal through. Someone's made a typographical error here. I can just fix that. There were people sitting there for three hours trying out completely the wrong technique because they just simply wouldn't go, have we got sin signal continuity through the network? And you can't go wrong in a data network if you use a normal, traditional audio troubleshooting method. It's really that simple. It's just understanding how the wires are put together. So we have our port addresses, which are our pairs on our multi-core, our IP addresses, which are like having many different multi-cores. And then right at the bottom, we have a MAC address which deals with how we get that stuff down to the next layer onto the wire. And this ultimately shows us uh, which interface we're going to leave our device by. And as we can see, we, we put these things progressively, and progressively our message gets bigger and bigger with this addressing information. This is something we call encapsulation. And it's something that we've also been doing for thousands of years. Let's use a more concrete example of this. IP stacks are abstract, so let's create some data. I'm going to write a letter. So I write, dear Mr. So-and-so, onto a letter, and I put that into an envelope. That's like taking my data and then starting to put my protocol and port address around it. I then put the letter into the envelope. I address the envelope. And then I take the envelope down to the post office, and that envelope is put into a postal bag, and that postal bag is moved to a different postal office. The bag is opened. They look at the envelope. They put it into a different bag. The idea of encapsulation is that the original message is not read by the intermediary service. So the post office should not be reading your mail. They don't have time. They need to be passing it quickly between bags. Sometimes they do. But yeah, th this is the entire method. And then they put the bags into different trucks, and the different trucks go to the correct destination. So it's not a new method at all. This is totally understandable. This is how any kind of network works. Um, something that occurred to me on my last adventure um, when we did this show in Germany a few weeks ago, um, we still refer to delivery services like DHL um, and people like that as, as networks, because they are. You, you, you give them a parcel, it goes onto their network, and their network infrastructure works out how it gets to the destination, exactly the same way that a data network does. Um, so yeah, that would be an address-centric network. 
and you need time to get a parcel onto an address centric network and off again. We had a small mess up with our delivery. We had two public holidays in Europe which basically destroyed a week of working time just before the show. And unfortunately our logistics people hadn't realised so we couldn't use an address centric network because of the delay inherent on getting the consignment onto and off the network. So of course we had to use a synchronous time centric network which was paying a guy in a truck to come to our office, pick the stuff up and then drive it direct to the show. Anybody who's done that knows how much more that costs. It, it costs eight to ten times more money. But if you need it delivered absolutely <laughs> on time, that's your only choice. So it, it's a good comparison between the two techniques. If you allow yourself enough time buffer, you can certainly achieve amazing things much cheaper on a address-centric network. And if you want stuff to arrive bang on time, you can use a time-centric network, but it will be less efficient and will cost a lot more. So we're talking about um, different modes of communication. There, there are two main modes of communication in a data network. They're called broadcast or unicast. And they become applicable in different places. We have something called a collision domain and we have something called a broadcast domain. Don't worry, we'll, we'll go into these topics. And we need to break these things up. So we want to break up, first of all, our collision domain. That's where messages can collide with each other. And we want to break up the broadcast domain, which is where messages can be heard by everybody. And we have some techniques. So we have a technique called address resolution protocol. Uh, we have uh, devices called VLANs. We have IP subnets and we have routers to help break these things up and manage them. So addressed messages give big flexibility advantages. I mean, if we can send something to a specific address, we can decide whether it's going to one person or to multiple people, whether it's going remotely or whether it's going locally. We have a lot of control over that. Uh, a TDM network by default doesn't have any concept of addressing. Now, it is entirely possible to encapsulate data onto a TDM network with, with an address sense in it, but it's not an inherent part of TDM technology. On a packet switch network, the addressee will be um, pretty much unique. Um, but it's also possible to send junk mail on, an, uh, on a packet switch network, which can go from one sender to all receivers or to multiple receivers. Now, it can be very useful to do this. In fact, it's essential to be able to do a bit of this. But it can also be potentially very irritating and quite damaging all at the same time. IP networks can be programmed to, to deal with this problem of getting unsolicited mail. Indeed, a very, very popular hacking technique to stop people's systems working is to flood their network with stupid nonsense data. That's one of the key things that, as a uh, protection engineer, you're worried about, stopping that happening. Um, there are three kinds of IP uh, messages um, in a V4 network. They're unicast, multicast, and broadcast. By contrast, on a TDM network, it's difficult to have that sense. You could think of all TDM messages as being unicast because it goes from point to point. But anybody who's had to split a MADI feed knows very well that you can take a T-piece and just uh, extend that onto a second device and take a copy. Uh, so that's kind of more like a broadcast message. All that does is illustrate the fact there is no sense of addressing inside a, a simple TDM network. So older IP networks used hubs. Now, hopefully, these things have all gone away. Um, I very much remember the first hub network I had um, back in the 1990s. And this was used to connect multiple computers together. Um, what it does is it's said to extend the collision domain. So it's like having an active repeater. A hub is potentially the most dumb piece of electronics going. It just, uh, just repeats the messages coming in. All messages in the hub are effectively broadcast messages. It has no way of distinguishing any kind of addressing. Um, effectively, using this method, we remove the idea of having a sorting office from our postal system. We just throw uh, paper envelopes everywhere and hope they get to their destination. 
So this is an important thing to remember about why IP networks are, are absolutely key. Um, packet switch networks will use a specific IP address to go to the broadcast. What that means is that if I send a message to that IP address, that goes to every single other device in my local area network. It's very, very useful to be able to do that sometimes. But in order for it to actually be really useful, we need to have something to sort the mail. So when I first started looking at uh, data networks, um, I had a computer system very like this. We had an old-fashioned token ring system using single-core BNC cables uh, with T-pieces and terminators. And this was in a small recording studio, and this was just about when computers were just beginning to be able to record audio. So we could record two channels of audio. Uh, and I was thinking, well, I can move 10 megabits per second of data on this cable. Why can't I move CD quality audio? Because the bandwidth of CDs is less than 10 megabits per second. Well, in theory, that's a good idea. But in practice, it doesn't work like this because we only have one cable connecting all of these machines. So if I send a message to computer number seven here, that's great, that goes down the cable. But these guys in the middle are going, oh, well, okay, that message isn't for me. They still receive it. It's boring. So they ignore it. So far, no problem. I've sent it from number four. It gets to number seven. Great. What happens when I send messages from two different machines at exactly the same time? I get something called a collision. I end up with data that is absolutely meaningless. Okay. So these two receiving devices can't understand what was sent because it's a mixture of both, um, both sent messages. That's, that's no good. What, I have to look at ways of dealing with this. Now, the, the first way of dealing with it is to understand that this error situation has occurred. And there is something called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection, Sorry. C which is CSMACD. Uh, and, we, and we use that in all kinds of networks even today. So, for exam example, uh, Wi-Fi networks have to use this. Now, that's fine. If we know there's been an error, we could do something about it. Well, the thing we want to do is we want to try sending the data again. So we do. And hopefully, we will send at slightly different times, and the data will get through. We can't guarantee that. So there was another layer of protection put on top called carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance which means that the sending devices have to randomly offset their sending time to make sure they get a gap. It's a bit like trying to cross the road without bumping into a car. And therein lies the problem with sending audio. What we're trying to do with the Dante network is we are trying to have very, very low latency, very, very highly synchronous audio. Now, if we introduce the concept of random time into that network, we can't do that. And on this style of network, we have to have the possibility of random time because otherwise our data would not get through. So this is true of these kind of old-fashioned hub networks. It's also true of Wi-Fi, which is why when people ask us, why can't we do Dante on Wi-Fi, that's exactly the reason. Wi-Fi has a random time element. Now, yes, you can trade off timing accuracy for latency, but for large numbers of channels, you would need latencies in the whole seconds to do uncompressed audio, which is why it doesn't happen very often. Typically, if you're doing audio over a Wi-Fi system, it will be some kind of compressed audio codec. You will still have quite a long latency, but it won't be full professional bandwidth audio. And that's exactly why. Also, the timing will probably be all over the place on Wi-Fi audio. And that's, that's not what we're trying to solve with Dante. What we have been successful with is dedicated wireless point-to-point -point links on dedicated frequencies. That works really quite well. There are some broadcasters who have been very successful with that. How we solve this problem in a wired network is, is quite easy. We, we use something called a switch. Now, the switch is smarter than a hub because the switch has an idea about addresses. So 
when we're sending data in unicast, that's one point to another around a switch, we send some information from computer A, and that goes to computer D. We can send some messages from computer B and computer C, and they only go to those places. They don't interfere with other traffic in the network. So switches only care about MAC addresses. Now, there are three different types of MAC address. There is the host MAC address, which is the address of the stack on a device. There's a special set of MAC addresses called multicast MAC addresses. These, these are kind of virtual MAC addresses which tell the switch that these are a special kind of traffic. And then there is the broadcast MAC address, which is a single MAC address which is all bits turned on. Uh, which in hex is written as FF, 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 um, or 48 ones in a row. Now, some network technologies only, only use layer two networks, which means they just connect a MAC address to a MAC address. There's nothing wrong with this idea, but it's limiting, because we were just talking about our example with the internet where we'd have a web page at a specific UDP or TCP port address connected through an IP address, connected through a MAC address. If I just want to connect my device MAC address to another device MAC address, I have to write all of the extra code around that to kind of create the idea about having different channels and different streams and different kinds of traffic, and I have to do that all by myself. Whereas if I use a normal network stack, or using the IP model, which goes all the way up to layer seven, then, then I can just deal with writing software and sending that through the network, and the details inside the network are handled in a standard way by all the devices. And of course, as we all know, the more code you make computer programmers write, the more bugs you get. So best to keep that minimal. The nice thing about using a normal network stack is that hundreds of thousands of engineers have already looked at this, and something like an open source sockets.h stack is fairly bug free. No nothing is ever completely bug free, but the more, the more pairs of eyes you get onto something, the more robust and more stable and better understood it's going to be. And you can even ask advice from people if you're feeling very brave. But people do make the um, question, why would I have IP addresses in a local area network? And, and that's really quite simple. Um, I, I do remember many years ago using different kinds of paper for sending different kinds of messages. So in the very old days, I would write on lightweight paper to send a message to a friend in Africa because it would cost less to post. That's not so true anymore. I normally just use normal paper now and I still get charged pretty much the same amount of money. I, I haven't seen airmail paper, certainly in Europe, for a very long time. Um, in fact, we probably all use email now anyway and would be using uh, IP addresses. Um, but the idea is about consistency. I have an addressing scheme where I can address the guy next to me and I can also address the guy on the other side of the world using the same method. That's true in the postal system. It's also true on a... Um, true IP network system. It means that I can identify a group of audio channels by a UDP port address, just in the same way that I would identify um, a web page based on its UDP port address at an IP address. I can use exactly the same methods. It means I can reach a global scalability, and it means I don't have to write multiple different software stacks to do the same task. Also, when I'm trying to manage resources inside a computer, if everything is using the same method for accessing the network, I can see everybody else trying to do the same thing. There are no invisible ghosts hiding from me. So I can make a simple call to the operating system saying, is this port that I want to use free? And I can get a meaningful answer back saying, yes, that's no problem. Whereas if I've written my own code, then it may not be so dependable. So in order to understand how we tie these things together, we have to use something called address resolution protocol. Um, I don't know if anybody 
has ever met an IT engineer who has told them that broadcast traffic is wrong? Yeah? Um, broadcast traffic is absolutely essential for determining addresses of devices in a network, and we'll, we'll look at why. So I've got my three network devices here, and nothing has happened on the network yet. I send out a message. I want to send a message from device A to device C, and I know device C's IP address, but I don't know anything else about it. So I send a message, which is a broadcast message, so it goes to everybody, saying who is 192.168.1.3. This goes across the network to everybody. And when this goes out, the switch sees the MAC address of device A and will populate this table. So now the switch knows that connected to the physical interface number one is this MAC address, AABBCCDDE01. This message gets to device C, and because from what we saw before, that we have a full address system where we have the source IP address, which is 1.1, .1, and the source MAC address on the outside of the Ethernet frame. Device C now, now knows everything it needs to in order to build a complete message back to device A, which it can do unicast. So it sends a message saying, one, hello 192.168.1.1, I am 192.168.1.3, and inside the frame header at layer 2 of the Ethernet frame, it knows the destination MAC address is this one here, AABBCCDDEE01. It will also add the source MAC address, its own MAC address, which will be um, that one there, 03. It sends that back, and now the switch also knows that device C's MAC address is attached to port number 3 of the switch, so it records that in its MAC address table. It sees the destination MAC address, 01, so it knows to just create a circuit between port 3 and port 1, and it knows not to send that data to port 2, because it knows that that MAC address is not interested. So a switch is like having something that can automatically patch cables on a per-message basis across a patch bay, send the message through, and then pull the cable out again. So switches stop that collision happening. That's how we can talk from one device to another directly. So we saw what happens there with broadcast traffic. In that case, device A sent out a broadcast message to everybody. It got a reply from one specific person. That meant it could start doing unicast communication. So what's wrong with broadcast traffic? I have a small network here. I send out a message going, who's this guy? He says, me, these two guys. Well, that's really boring. They, they ignore it. In a network with four computers in it, it's not such a big problem. Let's make a slightly bigger network. And of course, remember, in terms of major networking terms, this is still a very small network. I send a broadcast message from this guy. These go all these guys think it's boring. But remember, everybody else is doing the same thing. So we create lots and lots of broadcast traffic, which is very boring to everybody else. So it's not very handy, is it? So just like we broke up collision domains with a switch, we can break up broadcast domains with a router. So I can have two separate switches now. So now when I send my broadcast message, it only affects these guys over here. These guys don't know about it. If I want to send a message now from this broadcast domain to one of these guys, I have to do that unicast, as in a point-to-point -point message. And in order to do that, all I do is I put an IP router in between the two things. And now I can send from an IP address to another IP address, and I don't need to worry about the MAC addresses in between. This is where we started to have to use VLANs. Now, we, we've called VLANs voodoo LANs internally because people think that VLANs are magic. They're not. They're just useful, but they're, they're, there's no, there's no magic trick, this is not going to save your life, this is not going to make your audio perfect, this is not, not the cure for anything, it's just a tool. So originally, if we wanted to keep 
those broadcast domains separate, we would have to get different switches, physical switches, and a router to join the switches together, and we'd have to have separate wiring. So our problem with this is that um, we would end up wasting switch ports because we would have to buy a separate switch to connect these two guys together, and there would be spare ports here, spare ports here, spare ports here. And of course, as everybody knows, if you have an empty port, that just means that you've wasted some money, uh, which means the boss isn't going to be very happy. So someone came up with this idea of having multiple MAC address tables inside the same switch, which is all this is. So if you remember from the previous slides where the switch would remember the MAC address of the device connected to the physical interface, we have the same thing here, but it's just a simple database. So we can create a database that just has interfaces one, two, and three there, interfaces four, five, and six in that database, and interfaces seven, eight, nine, and 10 in this database. And we can call these databases VLANs. So that means I just basically break up what would be my one big database into many smaller ones. So before we had standardization in VLANs, that's exactly what we did. We just broke the databases up. We would put wiring into each group, and then we would have a separate cable running from that group up to our router. OK, so that solves the problem of having multiple switches. We can do this now on one switch. We've saved some money, but we haven't completely solved our cabling problem. So what happened was many manufacturers were saying, well, you know, we could actually make this better. We, we can put these two, all of these things together, but keep them separate and, and actually take this one stage further. And after a while, this got turned into a standard um, by the IEEE in the 802.1Q work group. And 802.1Q allows us to put a what we call a VLAN tag uh, into the uh, frame header, so where the MAC addresses live, we can put a tag from um, basically 0 to 4,095, so we have 4,096 different VLANs, which means we just put that onto the outside of a frame, and that tells us which group our data packet is a member of. And what that means is when we use these tags, we can use one cable to go to the router and keep those VLANs separate based upon that tag number means we save cabling. It means we can also pass multiple VLANs between multiple switches and keep those broadcast domains apart. Now what that won't do is it won't magically create bandwidth. It won't magically make one VLAN more important than another, although there are mes methods that you can do to achieve that, but you have to actively do that. So you can't, it just doesn't happen by magic. So this is how a VLAN would function. Um, we were talking earlier about how uh, Ethernet techniques were asynchronous. Well, they certainly are when we compare them to TDM networks. But we have to have some idea of synchronization in order to be able to tell the difference of the zeros and ones in our data word. We have to know where that first important one or zero starts and where the message ends. So in order to achieve this, we have a section right at the beginning of an Ethernet frame called the preamble. That's the first seven bytes. Then the eighth byte is what we call the start of frame deliminator. So if anybody has ever played in a band or an orchestra, this is a bit like a conductor getting everybody ready. So the start of frame deliminator is the upbeat, and then the downbeat is the first significant bit after that start of frame deliminator ends. So this is kind of everybody wake up, everybody ready, go. And that's exactly what's going on in this section here. First thing we send is our destination MAC address. This is important because the switch needs to understand immediately where this datagram is going to. It starts reading the destination. Hopefully, that message will be in its MAC address table. It can start connecting the incoming port to the outgoing port immediately. Out of politeness, we send our source MAC address where we have come from. That helps the switch to understand how to populate its MAC address table, and it also helps the device receiving the message 
to understand what we call the reverse communication path. So it knows where the message has come from in order to reply to. Next is the ether type. This is for legacy. Um, anything you see that Dante or anything else on IP will use will be ether type 2. It just is that way. And then we have our payload section. This is where our IP packet lives. So that could contain our IP addresses. It could also contain the data. In a uh, layer 2 network, that would just be all kinds of stuff. It doesn't have to be particularly anything inside that payload. In an IP network, it will be a specific format, but that's the next layer up. And then at the end, we have a CRC block, which is what we use to de determine whether all of the data was uh, delivered effectively and is uh, intact. So that goes into the switch. And when it goes into a switch that's VLAN sensitive, what happens is we add this section called the 802.1Q tag, which is what says which VLAN this is a member of. And here, that will be based upon which network port it came into on the switch. So we would apply a certain VLAN tag to it if it came in on these ports, and we would apply a different VLAN tag if it came in on these ports. That helps us to keep the data separate. What that tag means is that the uh, frame itself may only leave through ports which have the same tag. So because these ports have a different tag to the one that was applied, it will not be allowed to leave the switch through those ports. It can only leave through these ones. That's because we've broken our database up inside the switch. So what happens if I want to send to ports in the same VLAN but on a different switch. On one of these normal ports, when the, when the frame leaves, the VLAN tag is removed as soon as it leaves, so it has no data about which VLAN it was a member of. That means if I connect it out of this switch, it goes into, into no man's land. So what I want is a special kind of switch port or a special mode which does not remove the VLAN tag but instead keeps it on and allows me to pass it on to the next switch. Now in Cisco, oh, sorry. In Cisco nomenclature, this is called a trunk port. Uh, if you use most other vendors name for it, they call it a tagged port. So what that means is that uh, traffic going into or out of this port is expected to have a VLAN tag on it and is expected to keep its VLAN tag. Whereas these ports are called untagged ports, which means traffic coming in and traffic leaving will not have a VLAN tag. So that means it will have a VLAN tag added when it comes in and it will have the VLAN tag removed when it leaves the port. So by using a combination of these two different port modes, we can join different VLANs together across multiple switches. Which means that we can have stuff enter one port in one VLAN and leave by a different port in the same VLAN on a different switch. So everybody's favorite thing, IPv4 addresses. It's um. The, the, pr the biggest problem with IPv4, um, as far as I think, is that we nearly use numbers that people can nearly understand. If we just stuck to using hexadecimal numbering, no one would talk about IP addresses. Nobody talks about MAC addresses. Nobody thinks in hexadecimal. Certainly doesn't impress people. The problem with IPv4 is that the numbers feel human so people talk about them <laughs> when they really shouldn't. The reason why they're inherently boring is because what we have names, and humans are good with names, they're not very good with numbers. Um, computers are brilliant with numbers, let them do it. So here's some things, routers break up broadcast domains. We've seen from before that if I send a broadcast message, the switch will forward that, but the router won't. Routers don't care about MAC addresses. In fact, they actually obscure them because they destroy the Ethernet frame header when that's passed through the router. 
don't worry, we'll actually look at that graphically in a little bit. Uh, we can separate broadcast domains using VLAN tags. As we saw, we can limit the number of ports on a particular database using VLAN tags. And we can use routers to join IP subnets together. So there are two kinds of IP addresses that we use. We have a host address, which refers to a particular device, or more accurately, a particular network stack. And we have a network address, which describes a group of these addresses altogether. Now, the size of the IP subnet is defined by something that we call the subnet mask. Now, this is a four octet number that we can supply via DHCP, or we can supply it as part of a static IP configuration. And all this does, and this is the only thing the subnet mask actually does, is it allows a device to know which IP addresses are local and which IP addresses are remote. So what that does is if I am sending to a local IP address, that means that my device knows it can send one of those ARP messages to find the MAC address of that device directly. That means I don't need to talk to the router. I can create a direct connection to somebody in my same local area network and I can just talk to them without needing the router. If I see that the IP address is remote, I need to find the MAC address of the gateway and send the message to my gateway to get out of my local area network. And then I will hope that my gateway knows a route to get to the network that that uh, target IP address is in. But I'm only hoping at this stage. But what I do know is I can't ARP for it directly because I will not get a reply. That's what we use the IP subnet mask for, that, that's all just making that simple decision. There you go. Magic, eh? So we don't need to do a class on IP subnetting now. Oh, we will. Um, so the, the biggest problem is that um, we have a 32-bit number. And like I said, we have 4.3 billion possible IP addresses in IPv4. Um, if we had a broadcast domain that size, and we had devices asking who had whose IP address all day long, and we were sending uh, 4.29 billion I don't care messages back, no work would ever get done, would it? So we have to break up that massive broadcast domain into much, much smaller networks. That's also why if I connect a cable between two ports on a switch at home, I don't break the entire public internet. Imagine people causing broadcast storms on the public internet, nothing would ever get done. So this is why we have IP subnets. We can break down big networks into much, much smaller networks. And the subnet mask uh, represents the boundary between the network address section of our IP address and the host address. So if I, if I live in this small country lane, I could have my house name if there's only four houses, no problem. If I live on a big long road with thousands of houses in it, I would need to have a house number in order to give the post guy an idea about which part of the street to go into. And that's what we're doing with our IP subnet mask. So we're going to extend this slightly when we roll this out online. Um, there's still this strange talk about something called classful IP addresses. Um, has anybody heard of the idea of class A, class B, class C? Right, okay. So. These forms of understanding of IP addresses officially finished in 1993. That was the extinction event. So just like when the big asteroid hit the planet and killed the dinosaurs, classful IP addresses died in 1993, okay? Now look, there's nothing wrong with talking about dinosaurs, okay? I, I go to the museum, I see the big dinosaur. Dinosaurs are pretty cool, yeah? There's nothing wrong with talking about T-Rexes, but a T-Rex doesn't really show up on my lunch menu because I can't go and shoot one. So classful IP addresses shouldn't really show up in your network plan because they don't exist anymore, they're extinct. Now, the, re the reason why they're still talked about is basically because of something called IETF RFC 1918, which starts off really, really well. This is the um, standard that defines the difference between private IP addresses and public IP addresses. 
and it starts off well. It starts off with talking about things in the proper way to talk about them. This is in this what we call CIDR format. Uh, just here, this, this slash notation that we have here. Starts off like that, fantastic. But then unfortunately, it has a section where it refers to these as if they were classful. And that's where that confusion comes from. Other things to remember, by definition, a classful, public, uh, a classful IP address does not have a subnet mask. That subnet mask is only implied because in the classful system, uh, the, the size of the network is fixed. You can't vary it. So there is no need for an uh, IP subnet in a, in a pure classful network, which is why they don't exist. Um, the reason why they were ever referred to is to maintain backwards compatibility across actually now a very, very small number of networks in reality. So what we use now is a class-less IP address system which uses IP subnet masks. And IP subnet masks are definitely something that came from a class-less network. So saying that I have a class A network with a subnet mask of something different is a complete paradox. It's just wrong. It's confusing two different and quite opposing ideas. So we'll stick to a pure classless system, which is what we use now these days. And this is true for both IPv4 and IPv6. It's just the numbers for IPv6 are very, very tedious because they're all in hex. So what we use our IP um, subnet mask for is, this is a familiar one here, we use 24 bits out of our 32 to describe a certain number of networks and a certain number of devices in our network. So I can have 254 devices in each network because I have 256 available numbers here. I need to keep two spare all t at all times to describe the group of network addresses and also the broadcast address, so my real number of devices is always two less. And I can describe 16.7 million different networks using these first 24 bits. If I use a different size IP subnet mask, so here I'm only using eight bits to describe it, I only have 256 possible networks, but I have 16.7 million devices in each network. So if we think about our broadcast domain example, that means that if I sent that ARP message saying who has this IP address, in this case it would only get 253 other devices. Uh, it's not too bad. It would be okay. In this case it would get to 16.7 million other IP addresses. That's probably not okay. That's a, that's a very, very, very big network. Um, you would have to question whether someone would really want to have that many devices in a local area network ever. It's just too big. And then, of course, we can have much, much, much smaller networks. So I could have six devices in this tiny network here. Um, and I, I could have 537 million different networks. Now, this is a very, very typical network size for, uh, say, a, a home network or, or a small office where I have a few public IP addresses uh, covering a bunch of networks internally. So that's probably one of the most common network sizes that you would see uh, in, the, in the real internet. So there's some always confusion between VLANs and subnets. So a single VLAN is a single broadcast domain. Uh, an IP subnet is also a broadcast domain. So therefore, I could refer to a VLAN as an IP subnet. And in a normal data network, that's exactly what I do. I would have a VLAN with the properties of an IP subnet, and then my next VLAN would have the properties of a different IP subnet. The reason why this is a good idea is because if I put two different IP subnets into the same VLAN, I can create some serious problems. So when I send an IP broadcast packet, I send it to the very last IP address in my IP subnet. And that means that message will be mapped down to the broadcast MAC address. Now, there is only one broadcast MAC address. So that means if I statically address devices in two different IP subnets in the same VLAN, 
I w when I send a broadcast message, that will go to the same broadcast MAC address. That means potentially I could actually have messages going from one broadcast domain to another broadcast domain without needing to use a router. Now that's really bad. That is probably the way that the biggest hack in history occurred, uh, which resulted in a lot of money getting stolen. So in general, do not map two different IP subnets to the same VLAN. Um, look, you have to use some common sense here. If you're configuring network switches on your own private network and they're in one IP subnet and you have device in a different one, no, it's, it's not going to materially cause a massive issue. But if you're making a network that will be public facing, it's definitely something you need to avoid because it's a very, very big security risk. So the best tip is make each VLAN its own IP subnet. So this is how we do uh, a technique that we call router on a stick. This is how we can use different VLANs to map between different IP subnets. So I have device A here, and device A creates a, an IP packet. Uh, this has the source IP address, which is device A, and a destination IP address. Now, uh, in this case, our destination device, device B, is in a different IP subnet. We put our Ethernet frame onto the front of it, and we have our source MAC address, again, device A's MAC address, our destination MAC address. Now this time, because we have seen that the destination IP address is in a remote IP subnet, we know that we can't send out an ARP for it because we won't get a reply. So instead, we make our destination MAC address the default gateway of our network. This goes into our switch, and here, here we go into a VLAN. So here we're entering VLAN 2. So when the frame goes into that switch port, a tag is added by the switch, which says, OK, you're now a member of VLAN 2. This goes towards the gateway. Now, the gateway is our router, and the router is able to understand VLANs on its interface. So this frame goes out on VLAN 2 to the router. And as I said before, the router destroys the frame header because it only cares about IP addresses. It doesn't care about MAC addresses. What really happens is the router has an address resolution protocol table that covers this network here. So it knows the MAC address and IP address of everything in this IP subnet. It also has a separate ARP table over here because it knows the MAC address and IP address of everything in this network. That's how the router functions. It will basically just change the destination MAC address on the frame because it knows about the different values in the different tables. So now the router takes this packet and sees that uh, this thing has come in on VLAN 2 and it knows it needs to leave on VLAN 3 because it knows that the destination IP address is living in VLAN 3. So it takes the packet and adds a new frame header. This time, the source IP address is still the same, still device A over here. The destination IP address is still device B. The router hasn't opened up the packet. It's left the packet alone. All it's doing is changing the mail, mail bag that the packet's been put in, which is the frame. And so it just adds a tag saying, OK, you're in VLAN 3 now. And it also knows the destination MAC address, which is direct to device B. It then leaves through the correct interface on the switch, the one that's connected using the address resolution protocol table and the MAC address table of the switch, goes to device B. Of course, as soon as it leaves through this access port, the 802.1Q tag gets removed. And our source MAC address is now the MAC address of the router. And the destination MAC address is directly device B. Our source IP address is device A up here, and our destination IP address remains device B. So that's how uh, a router in an IP network works. It changes the frame addresses on the outside of the IP packet if it knows about that information based upon its own address resolution protocol tables. So why should we have different size subnets? Well, different networks are different sizes. We might want to have a network with a small number of devices, 
or we might have a slightly bigger network where I have 126 devices here, so I could use a 25-bit subnet mask. Somebody said here, hang on a minute, you can only really have five devices here because one of those addresses has to be the gateway. That's correct, but one of them could be a software-defined network. We can also have very, very small networks. So a slash 30 network gives me two real hosts. That would give me an IP address for this router this end and an IP address for this router at this end. This means I can create a linking network between two buildings. So every time I want to create a building-to-building -building link, I need to create a very, very small IP subnet in order to do that. If, if you're configuring multiple subnets, the best tip I can give you is if you start with the biggest subnet you're going to be working with and work down in size, it's much easier to have contiguous IP addresses so you don't waste IP addresses in the middle. If you start small, you can start leaving awkward gaps. So start big and work down. And then the last question about IP subnetting is, um, People always talk about, should I use static, should I use dynamic IP addressing? Um, personally, I always use dynamic IP addressing. Um, it's a lot less prone to human error. Um, I know I mess up numbers all the time. I'd rather let the computer do it for me. Um, for servers, static can be preferable. Um, you only need to look at um, how difficult it is to get a static IP address publicly now to realize how many technologies exist to make life easy. Um, until recently, the only reason you could get a public static IP address was to tell one of the internet authorities that you were doing uh, organization-specific SSL certificates. So if you want to get a public static IP address, that's what you have to tell them, okay? Um, everything else you'll be told that you can use dynamic IP addressing, which yes, you can do, but sometimes it can be challenging. The main reason for people wanting to hold on to static IP addressing is down to um, certain operating systems not having uh, such robust IP implementations in them. Um, this can extend from you know, desktop operating systems, which, which largely have been fixed in the last five years. Uh, through to um, equipment specific uh, devices which may not have a full IP stack implementation. So there are some devices that will just read raw packets without worrying about the, uh, uh, the port number and that they're not very compatible with the full stack IP implementation. Again, this is stuff that happened in the mainstream IT industry 10, 15 years ago and there are still devices that are trying to catch up with this. But it's, it's all heading in the right direction. This is all getting easier and easier. So I think that's time for a break. <laughs> I think you guys need it, yeah? Should we, should we take a 15-minute break? Yeah? Cool. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That idea of neutrality in a network, um, and it means that we can give different levels of priority to different services on the same network infrastructure. So. How do I look at what kind of differences I want in that service? Now, the things that we can control in the network are throughput, um, how much delay is uh, applied to some traffic, whether there's delay variation, and whether we have packet loss. So there are two basic forms of quality of service. There's the more popular class-based quality of service, which uses techniques like queuing and prioritization. For example, the technique we use called diffserve. It's nice because it's relative. Uh, we can basically easily differentiate between traffic that is important and traffic that is less important. And it's much, much, much simpler to implement from a network perspective. Alternatively, there are reservation-based technologies uh, which use things like rate control, traffic shaping, admission control. So there are things like NSLP, InterServe. Uh, people who've worked in cellular communications may be familiar with systems like Volti, which is voice over long-term evolution. That uses an end-to-end -end based reservation technique. And the thing with reservation-based uh, QoS is that it's absolute. You reserve bandwidth from the source to the destination. 
and that becomes more and more difficult because you have to make decisions about how often you work out what needs what resources in the network. So oftentimes you can have re uh, resources that are reserved and are doing nothing. Um, and you also have to make sure that your entire infrastructure understands those reservation messages in exactly the same way. Now what this means in practice is that you end up with one particular model of infrastructure device from one manufacturer because that's the only way to absolutely guarantee that a message will be understood in exactly the same way. And in some systems that's okay. Absolute quality of service is actually more complex to implement which is why it's never as popular but it is nevertheless in some situations useful. So it's again one of those scenarios where you look at the challenge and apply the correct tool for the job. The reason why we use a relative system is that audio over IP only really cares about a few aspects um, when it comes to quality of service. We care about delay variation. We don't want to have a highly jittered uh, clock. But we only care about this delay variation when it comes to our synchronization signals, which are our PTP signals. Now, thankfully, there's only a small number of those every second. It's somewhere between 4 and 10 per second, so it's very, very low rate traffic. So it, a small traffic profile to give a high priority to is no problem for anybody. The next thing we care about is something we call aggregate throughput. So we need to move thousands of packets per second across the network and those are the packets that contain our audio samples. Now in relative terms, compared with the speed of the network, we can actually tolerate quite a large amount of delay variation for these guys because the timing information is the stuff that we carry in, in that low data rate traffic in the PTP. Um, if you look at the number of packets per second we send, um, this was a mental exercise because it's very, very difficult to visualize how busy a data network is from numbers. So if I have a um, truck that is 14 meters long, and if I think of that truck as being uh, four channels of audio, and if, I, this, if that truck is traveling at 60 kilometers an hour, that truck will go past me standing at the side of the road, and the next truck will come 57 seconds later. That is the density of traffic I need on a gigabit network to maintain four channels of audio. So is it safe for me to cross the road that is only 14 meters wide in 57 seconds? I could sit down and have a cup of tea. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, that's, that's what, when we talk about quality of service, and I do not need quality of service in a network like that when I have one truck going past every 57 seconds carrying my audio. There's just no need for it. So that gives an idea about how much uh, density the traffic is in a, in a Dante audio network. We also care about packet loss. So by the same token, if we lose one of those trucks containing audio data, we will lose audio and we will hear that drop out. Now, if there's only a truck every 57 seconds, you know, we can be quite safe. It's not going to crash into anybody else. So, if we're dealing with such low density data, wh why, why bother with QoS? Now, we're not always going to be in the situation where we have um, a gigabit network. We, we should be ideally, but that's not always the case. If we think about our situation with the trucks again, now if we slow those trucks down to six kilometers an hour, now they're only 5.6 seconds apart. Much, much more dangerous. Slow everything down by 10, they're moving much, much slower, but they're much closer together. So we, ha we have a problem there with a 100 megabit network relative to a gigabit network. So what quality of service will do is it will can help us to squeeze more out of the infrastructure when there is um, a, a contention. And this is particularly useful when we're using different link speeds uh, in different areas. And it also can be useful when we're running shared network services like audio, video, and enterprise IT. 
But QoS is not magic. It cannot manufacture better performance. And also remember that we're still using a relative form of QoS. The best cure for QoS is bandwidth. Bandwidth is so cheap now. Um, my, my colleague, Dr. Ware, wrote these slides. And his, his PhD thesis was in quality of service. And his supervisor said to him at the time that doing quality of service is a complete waste of time. Why bother? Because his answer was, you can get bandwidth. That's the, that's the solution. And it's kind of right. Um, I was talking to a gentleman from a large uh, network switch manufacturer uh, in the west coast of America. And he said, well, look, look it's, it's, it's very nice of you doing a quality of service tag on Dante. But, but I don't really understand why you do it. Because, because at six megabits per second, you are a rounding error. When they're doing video at 12 gigabits per second, six megabits per second of audio is nothing. So he said, yes, it, it's very nice. You should do this. It's what good neighbors do, but it's meaningless. It's, it's a bit like cutting the grass and taking out the trash on, a, on the right night for the dust cart, yeah? It's a nice thing to do, but you don't have to do it. We also do some certain things with Dante to make sure that we need to engage quality of service less often. So we work very hard to make sure that we make a predictable peak load onto the system. So um, that means that it's very easy to work out whether your network is dimensioned appropriately. We don't send lots of bursty traffic. Um, we send relatively small amounts of data, and they're fixed packet sizes. And we also make sure that the transmitters distribute their network load evenly between themselves so we don't create big spikes. So quality of service is good in terms of if you consider a dynamics processor on an audio signal. There are, if I take a compressor on an audio signal, there are two things that can happen. The first thing that would happen is if my signal was below the threshold of the compressor, it's not going to have any effect. Well, it might raise my noise floor a bit, but not anything material. The other thing that the compressor may do is it may act on the dynamics of the signal. Now, if our signal is a sine wave and we put it through a compressor, and the sine wave is above the threshold of the compressor, then we get a distorted sine wave out. Dante is an even time period, even load data stream, so putting it through QoS will potentially distort that data. So QoS is there to protect Dante from other traffic, not the other way, not the other way around. It can help to minimize queuing in the switch, and it will greatly reduce the need for putting QoS on for good performance if you're dealing with something that's well profiled. So class-based QoS, like we use DiffServe, is um, the most widely deployed QoS technique. It's the thing you find most in switches. Uh, and that's basically down to the uh, prevalence of voice over IP. And uh, what it does is it uses a tag written into the um, IP header, uh, just like a VLAN is a tag. It, means, it doesn't mean anything in and of itself. It's just a number. And the switch needs to inspect each packet and map the packet to a specified queue at the output port. And then according to the algorithm that you use within the switch, uh, those queues will be emptied following those particular al algorithmic rules. So class-based QoS is simple. It has a low per packet overhead. It's just reading a tag. It's easy to implement in silicon. And the nice thing is it's distributed, so I can have different rules for quality of service on a per switch basis. So I could have different kinds of traffic happening in different parts of my network, and I could have different rules applied to those different sections accordingly. And it's very good at protecting high priority traffic from low priority traffic. Now the disadvantages are we can overload within the class, so we can make everything top priority. Uh, which, as we all know, when we make everything important, uh, nothing really becomes important. And, you know, in the vast majority of cases, this isn't really a limitation. DSCP that we use, um, the highest priority traffic uh, we would suggest would be PTP traffic. It's a very small payload. Our next priority is our audio traffic. It's um, got a few more packets per second. And, and below that, we use uh, a mapping for time-critical control data. 
So that's when you press the uh, button on Dante controller. We try to elevate that command to have a higher priority because nobody wants to wait for that green tick to come up to tell you the audio is flowing. So we think that message should get through quicker. And then the last queue is um, for everything else in the network, like internet traffic. So after this sorting criteria is applied, those frames are then put onto the wire in a sequential order. And this method's really good to basically differentiate high priority traffic from low priority traffic. So remember, PTP is only a few packets per second per device. Audio is several thousand packets per second per flow. We have chosen this example slightly deliberately. Um, so United Airlines, our friends there. Um, we put the different passages into the different queues. So in this case, we would put our PTP packets into our Premier Access line, our audio packets into our Group 2, our control packets into Group 3, and everybody else queues up in Group 4. Now, of course, um, just like a normal airline, when you get past this gate here, that's it, you're carrying on onto the plane. Uh, if someone comes running down this queue here and you've already just gone past there in Group 2, that's okay. They're not going to stop you. They're not going to grab you. They're not going to pull you off the plane, unlike United, who might. Um, there are quality of service mechanisms in wireless that can do that, but generally wired Ethernet systems don't do that. They don't use the United quality of service. Um, other, other things may do. But in a normal, friendly, nice QoS thing like a proper airline, we let the high priority people board, and if there are none of those, we let the uh, Q2 people board and we don't beat them up. We're, we're a nice networking technology. So the reason why it works is there are fewer priority customers than other categories, and this means that there is a minimal wait for the priority customers at check-in and at boarding. Where it doesn't work is if you're at certain airports where everybody has platinum status, like at Chicago, everybody's important, so everybody tries to squeeze into the same queue, and that's where it breaks down. So just remember not to do that. Here's a very, very simplified model of what's going on inside a switch. So we have a, a frame come in, and then when it gets to the port that it's going to leave from, it goes through this mapping based upon the tag that has been applied to it. It will then be put into a different queue, and then the queues will be emptied in order. If it's just Dante traffic only, the chances are that there will be no queuing required because everything will be sent in a nice sequential order anyway. So that will have already been taken care of by timing inside the Dante network. So re remember that because adding this extra processing stage actually does still take time. So remember, applying quality of service degrades the, uh, the quality of your network. It has to because you're doing something. So if it's a Dante-only network, it's very, very unlikely that you will ever need to use this. And actually using quality of service in a Dante network is worse for it than not using it at all. Uh, from experience, I have actually seen more problems caused by people setting up quality of service badly than not using it at all. Uh, the biggest network I have set up with no quality of service has more than 240 devices on it and runs 24-7, but it's a Dante-only network. Most people are not building networks that large. O another thing to watch out for, switches can use different quality of service queuing algorithms. So in general, we like the strict priority mechanism uh, because um, audio networking is not a democratic process. The timing is always more important than the audio, and the audio is always more important than the control. Um, in a data center, this is not actually the case, because I am trying to make sure that my resources, my incoming and outgoing bandwidth, are shared fairly between all of my servers. There's no room for fairness in audio over IP. The clock's always important, that's it. So we don't particularly like this weighted round robin system, because that means that some traffic is more important than other traffic some of the time. Weighted round robin massively increases your jitter on your timing packets. So it's a really, really bad thing to use for PTP. It actually makes it worse than not using any quality of service at all. And similarly, shaped round robin is a more extreme version of that. 
There are ways of working with it, but it gets incredibly complicated incredibly quickly. So try to avoid it. Try to use strict priority queuing as much as you can. So that means if we uh, pass a sync packet tag 56 through the network and apply strict priority, it will always go through the switch as quickly as possible. What this does is it minimizes the delay variance, so it minimizes our jitter. Um, and as I said, WRR or SRR increases this um, extremely. These are the tags that we use for diff serving Dante. So our time critical PTP is 56, audio is tagged 46, uh, our control traffic is tagged 8, and then everything else is tagged 0. And these actually align with default mappings in a lot of switches out there. Not really an advert, but a switch we use quite a few of in our office is the Cisco SG300. We, we like that because it has strict priority queuing on every queue. So it becomes very, very easy to set up. Basically, just set up the tags as shown, um, make sure you trust uh, DSCP, and, and you're done. It works. Trust DSCP. There was a switch guide kicking around once upon a time that said turn off trust, trust DSCP. If you do that, you've just turned off quality of service on your switch. You've also removed all of the tags from your traffic, so nothing else downstream will be able to understand any difference between them. This must have worked okay, because enough people told us that this was a very, very successful method, um, and they've been advised basically to turn quality of service off on their switches. Shows how significant QoS is for a Dante system. Um, the reason why you would not trust QoS in a large network system is that if you're in a large campus system, like a university, where you have a computer science department, if they work out what your priority mapping is, uh, they can make their own personal internet traffic higher priority than everybody else's. So in those environments, you would not trust tags coming in from, say, the students' laptops. You would apply a different set of criteria using access control lists, like shown here, and you would uh, generate your own criteria based upon MAC address, maybe based on username, based on a bunch of secret functions so that you can be in control of the bandwidth used in your network based upon your criteria. So there's some other QoS mechanisms that are fairly popular. Um, there's a system called uh, COS, or class of service. Um, the reason why we don't use this is because it's a layer two quality of service. So um, if you remember when we were looking at the VLAN tags, that lives in the 802.1Q header. So a few things there. Remember, most endpoint devices can't generate VLAN tagged traffic. Only switches do that. So they can't do it end to end. And also remember that when you go through a router, that 802.1Q tag is destroyed by the router. So you cannot maintain quality of service from end to end across a routed network. Whereas diffserve that we use, DSCP, is carried in the uh, IP header, so it doesn't get destroyed when you go through a router. Another popular thing with DSCP is to change the tag or change the mapping of the tag on a switch-by-switch -switch basis. This is really common, and anybody who has worked with a voice over IP system will be quite familiar with this technique. And then the last kind of IP-based uh, QoS that might be used is uh, IP precedence. And you know, simply, we don't use that because it has a much lower resolution than DSCP. There are fewer values to choose from. But there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just a smaller and doesn't scale as nicely. So on larger and more powerful and more expensive enterprise switches, quality of service can be a lot more flexible, uh, which means complicated, really. And you really need to go on a vendor-specific course to understand how these complex QoS mechanisms work because they get very, very complicated and have special commands. So if I was going to go and use a data center switch, I would definitely go and enroll on a course with, say, Cisco or Juniper or HP about that specific switch model to really understand it. There's too much variance for us to give a general catch-all advice thing, certainly in this course. So the most important thing, is quality of service likely to make a difference? Well, using QoS will catch momentary spikes in demand, just like a Dynamics processor. And th these are generally caused by traffic that's not tagged in DiffServe. So that would be stuff like internet traffic. 
Internet traffic's the primary thing people are concerned about. But just bear this in mind. If you're moving 512 channels of Dante in each direction over a gigabit network link, you've still got more than 100 megabits per second of bandwidth left on that network link to deal with other traffic. So consider how many people have a real 100 megabit per second connection to the internet. It's quite rare. E even getting a connection that's reliable at that speed is difficult. So in general, you need to have an extreme pinch point in your network somewhere to see any benefit from quality of service at all. And the best way of dealing with a pinch point in the network is to uh, build some more bandwidth into that pinch point. Um, that becomes increasingly easy because bandwidth keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And two years ago, I would not even talk about 10 gigabit links. Now they're very cheap. I mean, they're coming down to a few hundred dollars. And a 10 gigabit link will carry nearly 6,000 channels of audio. It's a huge amount of capacity. I mean, really, for as far as audio is concerned, the, the bandwidth question was really solved 10 years ago. Now we begin to talk about the bandwidth question with video, which is a totally different conversation. It's going to be a while. So you're more likely to see negative impacts on audio from over-configuration of quality of service as opposed to doing no configuration of quality of service. Right, let's have some lunch. How are we doing? Oh, sorry. Um, can we keep it to one o'clock and just take a short lunch break? Just 45 minutes, yeah? Lovely, thanks. <laughs>